this lecture, we are going to focus on our last loading case that we will analyze, bending of a wind spar structure. We will look into the function of the spar elements and how they transfer loads and stresses in the structure. To evaluate the function of the spar and the stresses in the spar due to bending, we will first simplify the wing spar structure to an elementary spar. We see two basic frame elements connected to each other. Each frame consists of a thin plate called the web with horizontal stiffening elements called the spar caps and vertical stiffening elements called the web stiffeners. When you would take the sheets out and apply a downward force in the middle of the structure, the rectangular structure of each element would deform into a diamond shape. This deformation is resisted when adding the sheets, and we would therefore end up with a structure that can keep its shape under the applied loading. So let's look at the structure with these sheets. Assuming the spar caps are stiff and rigid, therefore resisting bending deformation, the spar caps would exercise shear stresses on the sheets, and in return, the sheets induce shear stresses on the spar caps to be in equilibrium. Resistance against shear deformation is a resistance to tension and compression under an angle of 45 degrees. When we want to relate the shear deformation to the tensional and compressive deformation, the relationships between the Young's modulus E, Poisson ratio nu, and the shear modulus G should be used. When high forces are applied to the structure, the shear stress in the sheets will reach a critical level, resulting in pleat or wrinkle formation due to buckling. This is not considered as failure, since the diagonal function is still maintained by the sheets. Hence, the structure still functions well, and if the buckling is linear, the pleats will disappear after the load has been removed. Let's now look at bending of a simplified wing spar. We are looking at a clamped spar structure consisting of three frame elements connected to each other. The spar structure is loaded at the top joints by three vertical upward forces. The frame has a height of h and the length of the horizontal spar caps vary. The vertical forces will result in a bending of the structure. When looking at bending of the structure, the function of the sheets or shear webs is essential. The webs have to be supported on the upper and lower side by the spar caps to realize equilibrium. The webs transfer the external vertical forces into shear flow and the spar caps transfer the shear flow into normal forces. When we want to analyze all the shear and normal stresses in this structure, we need to break down the entire structure and solve for equilibrium for all the web stiffeners, spar caps and webs. This is quite a tedious exercise. So in this lecture, I just want to give you some basic rules to analyze these types of structures. Can we now find relationships between the applied forces and the shear flows in the webs? Then we first need to define a few terms, the transfer shear force D and the shear flow Q. Firstly, the transfer shear force D is a shear force at each location of the spar and can be found by solving for equilibrium. This shear force builds up toward the root of the spar structure when vertical upward forces are applied to the structure. Secondly, the shear flow Q is a shear stress over a distance in a thin walled structure. In this case, we have shear flow in the webs, which is equal to the transfer shear force at that location divided by the height of the spar structure. Within each shear web, the shear flow is constant. There also is a relationship between the applied forces and the normal forces in the spar caps at the location of the vertical stiffener the spark caps transfer the shear flow into normal forces. These normal forces are dependent on the bending moment at a specific location divided by the height of the spar structure. The bending moment is dependent on the vertical forces or transfer shear force as previously defined. Based on this, we can conclude that the first step to calculate the normal and shear stresses in the structure is to construct the relevant bending moment and shear force diagrams over the entire length of the sparse structures that you are analyzing. A typical example is shown for a cantilever beam with four applied forces on it. First, the shear force diagram is shown where you can see the jumps in the diagram at the location of the applied forces. The values of the shear force diagram dictate the slopes of the moment diagram as a derivative of the bending moment is a value of the shear force. We will now look at a representative wing structure where the lift is acting as a distributed load rather than concentrated loads and the weight of the engines and the fuselage are added as concentrated loads. We can then construct the corresponding shear force and bending moment diagrams. 
what can you see? First of all, the shear force diagram shows a linear increase or decrease due to the distributed load. Due to the relation between the shear force and bending moment, the bending moment lines are therefore parabolic. Once we know the shear force and bending moment at each location, we can calculate the shear stress and normal stress in the spark gaps. The shear stress in the webs is the shear flow divided by the thickness of the web. The normal stress in the spark gaps is the normal force divided by the area of the spark gaps. This is also equal to the bending moment divided by the moment of resistance, which is the height times the area of the spark gap. To summarize, spar structures consist of shear webs and spark gaps. The webs transfer the external vertical forces into shear flow, and the spark gap transfer the shear flow in normal forces. By first constructing the shear force and bending moment diagrams, we can calculate the shear stresses in the webs and the normal stresses in the spark gaps. You have learned the relationships between the applied shear forces and these stresses for a simplified wing spar structure.